Hi folks, Mr. Ackman here. Thanks for watching. Today's video is actually a supplement to what I did uh, in my usual videos. The reason is because the topic we're doing really requires you to pay a lot of attention to some intricate details and I felt that to give everyone a fair chance I would show you some of the equipment laid out. So what I've done for you, if you take a look down here, I've got a number of electric circuits. I've got some of the equipment that you'll be familiar with, such as uh, the helix over here and a galvanometer and the power supply. Uh, however, some of the stuff is new. For example, this one here you've never seen before, although the coils look somewhat familiar. Anyway, I'm going to explain what all of these are in a moment, but first I want to direct your attention to this uh, whiteboard here where I've written out the first part of today's lesson. So the topic is electromagnetic induction, and you would have read about this in your textbook. Also, I've already done a video on it, so make sure you refer to that. I'd like to draw your attention to a diagram that's from your textbook. It shows a power supply connected with a switch and a coil wrapped around an iron core or an iron ring as the book calls it. And then on the other side of the iron ring is another coil of wire which is a circuit that's just connected to a galvanometer which is a very sensitive ammeter. Now, this circuit is set up down here, so have a look down here and you can see here is the power supply, the kind we're familiar with from class. The current leaves the positive terminal and it goes through here. We have a switch and then it continues on into this device. Now what is this device? It is just a prefabricated coil which goes around an iron ring that you see here. On the other side is the secondary coil here are the leads which go through to the galvanometer, the very sensitive ammeter. So here's what I'd like to show you. I'm going to uh, close the switch. Actually, sorry, I'll open the switch. I'm going to turn on the power, and what do you think will happen? Probably nothing's going to happen because the switch is open, and sure enough, nothing spectacular happens. If we look at the reading on the galvanometer here, you can see it's at zero microamps, zero millionths of an amp, so we know there's no current flowing. Now what I'm going to do back over here, and it's going to be hard for you to see all of this at once, so I'll repeat it if you miss anything. I'm going to close this switch, and then we're going to take a look at what's going on over there. So ready? Close the switch, and now we take a look there, and we notice that the needle is really still at zero. Well, actually it's fluctuating a little bit, which will make sense in a moment, but the surprising thing is that it's still at zero. However, if I open the switch, now here's where it gets tough to see everything because the, the screen doesn't show, you can't see everything all at once. So maybe if I put that down there. Watch what happens when I open the switch. Ready? Watch the needle and the switch. What did you notice? As I opened the switch, the needle deflected to the left and then it went back to zero. Now what happens when I close the switch? The needle deflects to the right and then goes back to zero. Open, closed. So it's very interesting that the only way to get a current to really flow in this secondary circuit is to have the switch either in the process of opening or closing. Now, you may notice that the needle's fluctuating even though the switch is closed. That's because the power supply here is actually not so stable. It does have a slight variation in voltage and therefore it is due to its functioning basically behaving as if it's going on and off. That's why you see a little bit of fluctuation here. Okay, so here's something else I'd like to show you. I'm going to turn off the power for a moment and I'm going to disconnect the leads here. Notice these numbers, 220 and 110. That actually means that there are 220 wrappings or turns of wire here. There's only 110 there. The ratio is 2 to 1. So here's how we had it set up the first time. What I'm going to do now is take the leads from the main supply, the primary, and I'm going to put those in on this side, on the 110 turn side. And I'm going to put the secondary circuit that has the galvanometer into the other side with the higher number of turns. Now, what I'm going to do is turn on the power and start playing around with that switch. Ready? Can you see both? Okay. Watch what happens this time to the current. 
you should be noticing that the needle is deflecting much more than it did last time. And the reason for this is because this time the primary circuit has a smaller number of turns, 110, than the secondary. So now let's wrap up with some observations back to the whiteboard here. What is going on? The current flows in the secondary circuit only if the voltage and the current are changing. So what is the analysis? You need a changing current in the primary circuit in order to get the magnetic field in the primary to change. Remember right-hand rule number two. If a current is flowing, there is a magnetic field in a helix. Well, the iron core sends that magnetic field around to this side so that the changing current in the primary results in a changing magnetic field in the secondary. That changing magnetic field induces a current to flow in the secondary, which we register with the galvanometer. All right? Interestingly, the ratio of the number of turns n in both circuits gives you a difference in induced current. And these formulas are in your textbook, so I encourage you to take a look at electromagnetic induction and to find out what exactly they are. I did mention them in my previous video. Now, let's take a look at another setup, which is over here on this side. This time we have a helix once again, and I've got a permanent magnet, a bar magnet, which is just sitting here. Now, if you take a look at the galvanometer, the sensitive ammeter, you'll see the current is zero. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the magnet here and I'm going to insert it into this end of the helix. And I want you to try to watch what happens to the galvanometer needle. It may be difficult to see both of these at the same time, so let's give it a try. Right now I'm inserting the north and you see the needle deflect. But now the, magne the magnet is just sitting there, the needle stays at zero. When I remove the magnet, the needle deflects the other way. I don't know if you saw that, so I'm going to try it again. Uh, the north pole is now being inserted, and the needle deflects. The north pole is now sitting stationary, there's no deflection. The north pole is now being removed, and the needle goes the other way. So what you find is that it's not a magnetic field that causes a current, because look what I can do over here. If I just leave the magnet sitting in here, then if we go over to the galvanometer, there's no current. However, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull the magnet out, and I want you to watch that needle. You see the needle deflect. Now I'm going to put the magnet in. You see the needle deflect again. It's a changing magnetic field. And that is what happened over here in the electric example that I did with an electric circuit. Changing electric currents resulted in changing magnetic fields, which induced currents in the secondary circuit. All right. Now let's take a look at the circuit here in detail. I'd like you to just focus in on what's actually happening here. When I insert the north, the needle deflects to the positive side. Okay, I'll show you that one more time. North being inserted, needle deflects to positive side. Oh, sorry, I don't know if we caught that on video. I'll try one more time. North being inserted, needle deflects to positive side. So what does that mean? Well, you notice that this is the positive terminal of the galvanometer. That means current entered through here and it came out the negative. In other words, by taking this north and inserting it, I caused a current to flow this way. Now if we follow the wires in this helix, what do we notice? The wire over here, coming up the back, is the wire leading to these. So in other words, I got current to flow up the back and into this wire and into the galvanometer. Right hand rule number two puts my thumb here, which means this was the north end of the helix. When a north gets inserted, a current is induced to flow and it creates a magnetic field whose north meets the incoming north. So let's go to the board here and see if we can figure this out. Here's a diagram of what just happened. The galvanometer needle went to the right when the current flowed this way and when the north was inserted we realized that a north resulted due to the induced current. What would happen if I reverse this? If I remove the north, as you see here, the opposite happens. Remember how the needle went the other way, which tells me that the current flowed the other way 
which if I do right hand rule number two, tells me there's a north at this end and a south at that end. So what is the rule for predicting what direction the current will flow? Well, that's what we call Lenz's law. Let's have a look at the analysis and the conclusion. A changing magnetic field induces a current in the helix, not just a magnetic field. It's got to be changing. The induced current produces its own magnetic field, right-hand rule number two, and this induced magnetic field, is, what is it doing? I'm going to explain this in a minute. It is opposing the change that creates it. Back up here to see what I mean. When a north was inserted, we got a north produced. That shows repulsion, which is opposing the change. When the north was removed, a south was re what resulted, which attracts the north back in, once again opposing the change that is creating it. This is known as Lenz's Law. All right, folks? Okay, folks, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at an application of Lenz's Law to a piece of technology that's actually very important in your lives. This piece of technology is called the Electrical Transformer, and over here, I have a familiar piece of equipment that we've been using throughout this video. Uh, once again, we have two sets of coils which are wrapped around an iron core, or an iron ring as it's sometimes called. Now, the coil on my right here says it has 55 slash 16. That means 55 turns of wire and the thickness of the wire, it's called 16 gauge. You can ignore that second number. The important one is the 55. And this one here is 220 turns of 25 gauge wire. Ignore the gauge number, just can concentrate on the 220. In fact, the ratio of the two is 4 to 1, four times as many turns as in here. Now this coil I've hooked up to a power supply that's a little bit different than the previous one, this one is an AC power supply. It's going to provide us with alternating current, unlike the other one that had direct current. So this is actually the type of electricity you get out of the hand crank generator that we've been using in class for some of our demonstrations. Anyway, the alternating current will enter into the primary coil. Because it will be reversing direction periodically, the magnetic field in it will reverse direction. That magnetic field will come around to the secondary coil it will reverse direction, and as we've seen with Lenz's law, the changing magnetic field will induce a current to flow. And what I've done is I've set this up to a voltmeter, a digital voltmeter, which measures AC volts up to a maximum of 200. So, are you ready? I'm going to turn this on, and I want you to observe the voltage on the power supply and compare it with the voltage in the secondary coil. Here we go. So let's get a decent voltage going there. There's a, about 5 volts across the primary, 4.7, 4.8. What do we have in the secondary? You'll notice that there is 11.2. Make sure you can see that decimal there. In other words, the voltage has gone up. The reason the voltage has gone up is because the number of turns in the secondary is larger than in the primary. Now, if I turn off the power, and I reverse this situation, so I unplug the primary, unplug the voltmeter, and now what I'm going to do is make this the primary with 220 turns, and I'm going to move this over here, so this becomes the secondary at only 55 turns. Now the ratio is lower, four times lower. Let's watch what happens. The voltage is now a little higher in the primary at 10, 10.2, and notice that the voltage has dropped in the secondary to just 1.6. So what you've just seen is an example of what we call, this is a step-down transformer. This device with different numbers of turns of coil transforms the voltage down, and what I showed you before where this was the primary and the voltage went up, we call that a step-up transformer. So the purpose of these devices is to make the voltage that is coming out of your wall socket uh, appropriate for whatever application you have. For example, 120 volts AC is too much for something like your smartphone or your computer. So your smartphone charger or your computer has a little transformer in it which drops the voltage to an appropriate level. On the other hand, as you've read in the textbook, there's a sample problem in one of the chapters 
where they talk about how the electricity company generates electricity and what they do is they step up the voltage to around 500,000 volts. That's the voltage of those overhead power lines you see when you're driving along the highway. You see them on those, uh, those metal towers. The reason the voltage goes so high is because, as you'll see in that problem, when the voltage goes up, the current goes down. And remember, power equals voltage times current. Well, power, which is related to energy, must be conserved. So back to the transformer here, when the voltage goes up, the current goes down, and therefore the total energy is conserved. One last thing to point out, you may have heard when this was on, I don't know how well you can hear it, if I turn it up, you might be able to hear some humming. I'll, I'll quiet down in a sec. Can you hear that? There's a little bit of humming. That humming indicates that there is some vibration going on, and of course sound energy is being emitted, and actually as I touch this, it's quite warm. There's some heat energy. So the ratio of the step up or step down theoretically should be the same as the ratio of the turns, in this case 4 to 1, but it's never exactly going to be that way because of losses of energy to other forms. Anyhow, that's it for transformers and lenses law and electromagnetic induction. Hope this video has helped you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in class.